The Future of Smart, a project of grant makers for education, will explore ideas at the intersection of education, equity, and philanthropy that point us towards a radical re-envisioning of our education system. We'll hear from those working at the edge of what's possible and explore what it means to support transformative change for young people and their communities. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Smart podcast, a project of Grantmakers for Education. My name is Olka Joshi Hansen, Chief Program Officer of Ed Funders, author of the book The Future of Smart, and your host. In 1960, 41% of American adults had a high school degree and some kind of post secondary education. In 2020, that percentage increased to 91%, with post-secondary pathways that include community college, traditional four-year degree programs, certifications, and courses in the skilled trades. Any conversation about transforming young people's educational experience can't ignore what happens in the post-secondary space. This is especially important since we now know that adolescence and the critical brain development of that period extend into the mid-20s. So how should our growing understanding of human development and learning change how we structure young people's experiences beyond high school? In today's episode, we're going to explore what transformation could look like within one post-secondary pathway, the four-year liberal arts program. It's clear that college admissions processes exert far too much influence on kids' education well before they reach college age. In communities around the country, it's perfectly normal for families to compete to get into the best preschool programs, assuming that this is the first necessary step for admission into highly selective college programs. High school educators considering new programs find themselves in a bind. How can they assure worried parents that young people will be better served by the kinds of human-centered approaches to learning that we've been exploring in this podcast? when that means foregoing the traditional measures that college admissions personnel look at so closely. These worries help keep in place advanced placement classes, single content courses like biology and chemistry, and grade point average rankings, even while they discourage internships, projects, and non-traditional learning. This in turn pressures middle schools to prepare kids to be competitive in high school, and so on down the line. It's not clear that things get better once students are admitted into programs. The College for All push of the last two decades was driven in large part by a desire to ensure that all young people would be employable in a changing world. Students and families are increasingly operating out of a fear that the only way to be economically competitive is to earn a college degree from the best institution they can attend. This has sparked concerns that students are approaching higher education as consumers, They pay money in exchange for a degree, which is not necessarily the same thing as an education. Critics argue that this is leading programs to avoid controversial or uncomfortable topics, to inflate grades, and to shift instruction in ways that are at odds with the idea of higher education as an opportunity to develop critical thinking skills and learning-oriented mindsets. In addition, there continue to be deep disparities in terms of which students can access the financial, social, emotional, and academic supports they need to successfully complete four-year programs once they're admitted. Our guests today offer us insight into what a four-year honors college program could look like if it was designed around more human-centered values. Dr. Marta Eskelin is the Associate Dean of the Honors Living Learning Community an assistant professor of professional practice at Rutgers University, Newark. Angel Velez is a proud graduate of Big Picture Camden High School and a senior in the Honors Living Learning community. The HLLC is redefining the notion of honors by creating intergenerational and interdisciplinary learning communities that are made up of students, faculty, and community partners who are focused on tackling some of the nation's most pressing social issues. The HLLC takes on notions of merit and who's deserving head-on, framing them as a challenge to identify and cultivate the untapped talent of our nation's increasingly diverse new generations. Marta describes the critical questions that drove the design of the HLLC. 
If the purpose of a liberal arts education is to prepare the next generation of citizens, change agents, and thought leaders to contribute to our democracy, how will we identify those change agents and leaders? And what skills will they need to impact the change that we so desperately need? It turns out that when these are the questions driving an honors program, a lot changes, starting with recruitment and admissions and extending into how relationships and learning experiences are structured. Join me in learning more with our guest today, Angela and Marta, I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks for joining. So as we, I want to start uh, just with a question about you, you know, who we are as people and our own journeys um, really shapes what we do every day. So Marta, I'd love to hear what it is about your personal story that inspires you to do the work you're doing today. Thanks so much, Olka. Um, So I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, but grew up primarily in Montclair, New Jersey, uh, which is a suburb outside of Manhattan. And my father is Afro-Puerto Rican. My mom is Russian Jewish. Uh, They moved from Brooklyn with us to Montclair in the 1970s Um, because it was more affordable at the time to raise a family there. And they heard that Montclair was very welcoming to mixed race families. Uh, So, you know, Montclair is known for its diversity and progressive public magnet school system in which kids from upper income and the predominantly white side of town went to school and were bused to the same integrated school with kids from the middle and lower income black side of town. Um, you know, that representational diversity didn't always translate into real diversity and integration in the classrooms. Um, So my experiences with racialized tracking where the classrooms match the neighborhoods and the quality of education and college guidance in my black and brown classrooms mirrored those of many under-resourced schools in communities of color across the United States. Uh, That experience left me feeling really alienated from my educational experience. And at the same time, the white students in our AP courses in the same public school received more of a private school education and were affirmed and valued for their intelligence. The result for me personally is that I believe I only went to college because of my white adjacency. So my, my mother, who was college educated, Uh, taught me and helped me with the college application process, brought me to college visits, and I eventually graduated from high school with no guidance uh, from a guidance counselor and no confidence in my intelligence or academic abilities. And it wasn't until I went to the University of Vermont where I had my first Black woman professor, um, and I was told that I was smart um, and quickly became a scholar of sociology and women's studies under her tutelage. Um, So this experience generally taught me a few very profound lessons that have deeply informed my career, my work, and they are really um, that one, (laughs) um, the the real question for me, the critical question guiding my work is why are Black, Latinx, and students from economically marginalized backgrounds not graduating college at the same rates as their peers, right? And there are two possible answers. One is the problem lies with the students their communities and families, right? That there's something wrong with us that needs to be fixed, right? Which we know is a deficit paradigm or it's structural, right? It's systemic. The answer lies in the systems, structures, policies, and procedures designed to educate our children. Um, and, I, and I believe that it's a systems um, issue uh, that is informed by a deficit paradigm. Um, but I, you know, the reverse, what I will say is that, um, you know, these kinds of deficit paradigms which label Black and Latinx students specifically as less intelligent, lacking skills, knowledge, and competencies have extremely detrimental impacts on academic success and psychological well-being of students of color. Um, And research on stereotype threat, microaggressions, imposter syndrome within higher ed supports these findings. Um, And that these environmental challenges, the same ones that alienated me from my education, result in staggering numbers of Black, Latinx, and economically marginalized students not graduating from college. Um, Mm -hmm. And that reality not only impacts our lives and our families and our communities, our success, our mobility, but also robs our society of their brilliance and talent, right? Mm -hmm. So the reverse is true that if we, right, in educational environments focus on assets and strengths that students of color bring to the environment, specifically 
labeling students as intelligent, talented leaders that can impact the world and their communities, um, that can have a tremendous positive impact on student success. So that's a little bit about me and my story. Thanks so much, Marta. Now, Angel, you're going to be graduating next spring, so let's go back and tell us a bit about your journey to Rutgers Newark and the HLLC. Yes, thank you, Olga. So for me, um, I grew up in Camden, New Jersey, which in the state of New Jersey is one of the very low-performing districts in this um, state. Um, And throughout my years in school, uh, we went through multiple substitute teachers being Um, In the classrooms, absent teachers in major subjects like math, language arts, literacy, um, and those gaps barely being filled in for ourselves. Um, And we're in that environment, not also being nurtured to go and try to figure things out for ourselves either. So my middle school years, I would go and elementary school years, I would go uh, and be disrespectful, not intentionally, but I was frustrated with the system as well as like a lot of students were. And so... When I came to applying to Big Picture, to Big Picture High School, um, I was really wanting to be in a space where I was valued. And when I remember going in for a tour and I felt like I was somewhere where I was going to be heard, um, I wasn't asked questions about report cards. I wasn't asked questions about um, how I'm doing on tests or standardized testing. Um, I was genuinely asked questions around myself, what I value, things that I find interesting. Um, what projects, if I wanted to do any in my community, would be something that would propel me into uh, learning different subject uh, matters or areas. And so coming from a a family that was very toxic and and didn't really um, cultivate or nurture like learning in the way that I felt like I needed, um, which isn't my family's fault. They only taught me what they knew. And so trying to figure all of that out at the same time, was really difficult and which is what led into high school being, I think for me, a very pivotal moment in my life where I felt like I had my family that while they weren't my blood family, what made me be successful throughout high school, even throughout my ups and downs, was having people show up in the, as their authentic selves. I mean, Rutgers Newark, when I visited, instantly stole my heart. I felt like it was a home away from home. I saw people that looked like me. I saw people that valued education and and valued wanting to progress and didn't allow themselves to be products of their environment, but rather products of their own expectations. Um, and so when I heard about the Honors Living and Learning community and I was reading through the application process, I wasn't actually going to click it because I was already under the impression that I wasn't good enough for these very prestigious programs, right? And so my, I remember sitting in my um, mentor's office at the law firm, my internship, uh, my senior year of high school, and she cleared my calendar for the day and hers. Um, we sat down and filled out the application and she refused to have not let me click that option. And um, while I know I've done a lot of the groundwork to get to where I am, if she hasn't, if she hadn't told me to click the option, I wouldn't be where I am in the HLOC now. Um, so I think that was a very revolutionary moment for myself. Um, but the program, once I went in for the first interview, it was as a lot of students in the program that I talked to that I'm friends with, and you know, we've gone through the years, like it just felt like heaven in school for us. That's great. Thank you so much. As a Jersey girl, I'm loving having New Jersey in the house. I want to dig a little bit into the story of the honors living and learning community, um, because a lot of folks might not be familiar with it and what makes it so unique. So Marta, um, tell us a little bit about the story of um, the college. What What's its origin? What need was it designed to fulfill? Absolutely. So at Rutgers University in Newark, we have embarked on a really exciting journey um, guided by a few critical questions. And really, um, if the purpose of a liberal arts education is to prepare the next generation of citizens, change agents, and thought leaders to contribute optimally to our democracy, how will we identify those change agents and leaders? 
and what skills will they need to impact the change that we so desperately need in our communities in this country and in the world. Um, and honors colleges in particular are charged with identifying, as Angel mentioned, some of the most promising scholars and thought leaders. And so at Rutgers University Newark, um, we've taken on the challenge of revolutionizing honors and reimagining our honors enterprise. So we take seriously our mission to identify and cultivate change makers and thought leaders of tomorrow, we must also interrogate the structures and systems within our institutions um, and honors colleges more specifically that fail at recognizing the brilliance and talent of so many students who are the promise of tomorrow. And this is especially true for those who identify again as black Latinx or those who come from under-resourced or economically marginalized communities. Um, as evidenced by the dearth of representation of these demographic groups within honors initiatives across the country and gifted and talented programs more broadly. Um, so the challenge is one that we, you know, we face here in Newark, New Jersey, in a city that has been a destination for immigrants and migrants in search of a better life for generations. And just to give you a couple stats on why this matters so much, um, in 2015, only 16% of Newark residents 25 years or older had attained a bachelor's degree in comparison to the statewide average of 38%. So the question, well, what's happening? So we were founded in 2015, the HLC, which is an acronym for the Honors Living Learning Community, under the leadership of our chancellor, Nancy Cantor, as a response to this challenge, right? And is helping Rutgers Newark to realize our anchor mission um, and, which is about identifying local talent, right? So those not exclusively Newark residents, but with a real focus on identifying Newark um, and greater Newark residents, um, local talent who will be the change agents of the future, many of whom have been overlooked for, long, for too long. Um, and so our enrollment reflects our vision um, and the demographics of Newark. So one third of HLC scholars are transfer students from local community colleges. We recognize that, you know, most students who are economic, first generation, economically marginalized, their first interaction with college is through community colleges. Such a high percentage. So it's re we have a real commitment there in New Jersey. So one third are transfer students from local community colleges. Over half are from Newark or greater Newark. 40% are first generation college students. 75% are Pell eligible, right? Which, which recognizes that they are um, categorized as economically marginalized. 70% identify or, as black or Latinx. Um, and you know, before the pandemic, it, it suffered a bit, but our retention rate is at 98%. That's great. Now, before we jump into hearing about the program itself, I'd love to hear from you, Angel, about your experience with the admissions process, because my understanding is that it's quite unique. Yes. Yeah, so one of the beautiful things I learned at BPLA was public speaking and being able to, in exchange, in not taking exams, we did 45 minutes or an hour and a half presentations four times a year, each marking period to to demonstrate what we've learned in each of our subject classes. You know, I built on public speaking, being very comfortable and talking in front of large crowds and talking in front of people and being able to kind of, with the internship process looped in through that, um, elevator pitches, right? Preparing myself for interviews, preparing, creating interview questions and having to practice them with stu uh, different staff members and getting approval before going out to pursue an internship. I think once I went in for the first interview and saw that it was interview, like the honors living and learning community was an interview process. Um, I think that instantly kind of made me feel very comfortable and told, and it was reassuring to myself that this is someplace I need to be because mm -hmm. it's already up front, not worrying about exams. Um, and, you know, it, it, to me, I just don't, I personally don't demonstrate, can't, I'm, I don't like demonstrating what I learned through a piece of paper. I can talk, I can show, I can create things, but through an exam, it's just not for me. And that's mm -hmm. really what made the honors living, honors, um, living and learning community, as well as my peers, feel really comfortable and at home and make college a possibility. 
So Marta, I'm going to go back to you to tell us a little bit more about the application process. What were the values that drove that design? And why were those values important, particularly given the ways in which you wanted to open up the experience of an honors college to more students? Absolutely. Um, great hearing about how Angel experienced the process. And uh, I just want to start by saying, uh, you know, it's very important to us that we didn't have any bar barriers to access um, for students to the application process, right? And that is one distinction, a big difference, I think, between uh, our honors college and other honors initiatives, the model and the admissions process and kind of the, the values that undergird it. First, we had uh, some critical questions again. How are we going to identify this next generation of thought leaders? What skills will they need to be successful to impact change? Will we miss them by relying primarily on standardized test scores to determine who gets a seat at the honors table? Um, and, how, and, and how do we actually do it, right? So in terms of the admissions process, um, uh, we've designed a holistic admissions process that really eradicates structural barriers while also simultaneously critiquing these deficit-based ideologies. Um, so in addition to the regular process, the students come in and, um, as I said, they go through a two-phase process. The first interview, um, all you have to do is check off that you're interested. And actually, we're changing the process now that it's automatically checked off. So you have to That's uncheck great. it to, to not get invited. So we're That's doing great. everything we can to get as many students through the door as possible. They come in, um, they are in, in, they go through a three hour interview with a number of interactive activities um, focused on absolutely talking about values, experiences, being involved in group projects, thinking about um, if you could change your community or if you could allocate resources in different ways, what would that look like, right? They have to create things together um, and they are observed by faculty, staff, older HLLC students, right? So you could be a fabulous scholar, but if you're in a group activity and you are cutting people off or dominating, not letting anyone in, or you're totally disengaged, right? There's so many ways that um, we expect students to interact because that is what our classrooms look like. They're living together, um, but also in the world, right? Angel talks about project-based learning in, in the kinds of careers that people are going to be involved in, in terms of community organizing and working across community. How do people work together? Um, so I think there are a lot of um, skills, knowledge, right, that students need that are definitely not measured, um, even in terms of looking at a transcript in that process. Um, and so students are evaluated. And then, and then we call about 60% back based on their scores, to an individual. And there we do a deep dive into a student's personal narrative, their story, what have the obstacles been. We're looking at criteria related to resiliency that is really from a culturally responsive place. So um, Tara Yoso has a cultural wealth model where she's really thinking about, we're thinking about res not measuring a student based on um, how they would be able to navigate systems and do they have cultural capital to do that, um, you know, based on kind of a Eurocentric model. We're looking at how have you made it to this point, right? Students who have made it to this point so far, especially if they've dealt with obstacles, have transferable coping mechanisms, um, motivations. That's what Angel, I loved what you said when you said um, measuring students, I think, by expectations. You said it so brilliantly, right? But really understanding that they are brilliant already. They are resilient. How do we figure out how to translate those into an academic environment, right, and see them as assets? Those um, strengths coupled with high touch support, um, as well as um, really culturally responsive pedagogy, which is really important, right? Students seeing themselves in the curriculum, being inspired, we think is the recipe for success. Um, but it is a competitive process. We choose 80 students out of hundreds and hundreds of applications. Uh, as I said, 40% are incoming transfer students every year, an incoming cohort that is diverse. Uh, from a variety of spaces, but what they all have in common is they're extremely passionate about social justice. They're leaders in a variety of fields, and they have different levels of academic strength, but all of them 
can be successful in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So Angel, I'd love to hear from you as a student. What has your learning experience been like? And I'm sure you have friends and, and family who've had different. So I'm curious a little bit about your sense of how it looks side by side with maybe a more traditional um, higher education experience. I feel like my college education is very, I want to say humane, just being in the honors living and learning community and going through classes, right? I was in Dean Eskelin's Navigating Spaces, Places and Identities class that really was the stepping stone for me and in, in opening my mind and world into the different things that normal education, higher ed models don't really tap into. Um, and And just all the multitudes of different classes that I was able to go through with students from different backgrounds that we're in the same class, but, you know, different things are happening in our minds. We're thinking of these things differently. We're coming together to talk about the broader topic and and just with all our different views on that topic. I think, you know, for me, it's been something that I've been so appreciative. I'm a firm believer that I am where I'm supposed to be with who I'm supposed to be with and doing what I'm supposed to be doing, this program has really just affirmed me in the things that we do and the powers that we have intellectually within that we can do in our communities, the way we can go out and enable others and tap into others that may feel or lack the same support that we're receiving to be able to go back. And and I've gone to Camden one time since I've been into the university. I've gone to visit my high school. And it felt good to be able to talk to students there and really let them know that that what you may think is an obstacle for yourself truly is not an obstacle once you have the proper support in your circle and people that know. It's hard to always see or believe something about yourself you can't see. And it's beautiful when you have people who can see that in you. Mm -hmm. And then once you realize that and you come to that realization afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks. So Marta, Angel's given us this feeling uh, uh, and the experience. And so again, tell us a little bit about the design of the learning experience and the components of that that have allowed Angel to walk away with this sense of himself as a scholar, a student, and a person. So in, what I'm hearing Angel talk about is the ethos of this program, uh, which is important. And I actually think that conveying an ethos, giving students a sense of belonging to something, a sense of purpose, uh, is missing from a lot of programs. So I'm, I can tell you about the elements that I'm going to, but ultimately we do a lot of work to help affirm. We recognize that students are walking in with internalized inferiority, right? Complexes with imposter syndrome. That's one of the first things I say in the orientation, right? There are a couple values that we hold um, dearly. One is we did not make a mistake on you, right? We believe in the students who are there. We thought very carefully about it. So we want them to know that. We recognize that many of them are coming to the table having internalized ideas that they are not smart enough. They shouldn't be here. So we have to do the work to make them understand that they do belong. And then secondly is a community building. Um, a core component, a theory of change for us is that cohort model, which reflects a family unit. Right. And I'm not saying that everyone comes from a great family unit, but what I will say is that generally we come from communities, many of our students, where family and community is valued. Right. That sense that um, we're larger than our immediate nuclear family. We need to depend on each other in different ways. We reinforce that value. Right. So that you're looking at your peers, that this is your family for the next few years. Right. And your success is not individual. It will be based on the strength of our cohort. So we do a lot of work to build that. So I, I wanted to say that at the outset um, and that our deans reflect the demographics of our students. How often do you go to higher ed institutions where you have people of color who are in these roles? So those are a few pieces, but the, the core elements of the program are. One, 
Um, they take core classes together, 18 credits, like any honors college, there is a, a minor or a core curriculum focused on themes of local citizenship in a global world through a variety of disciplines, right? So if you're a doc, you want to be a doctor, you need to be culturally competent. If you're in business, you know, how do we create, um, you know, financial literacy for our communities? If, you know, humanities, it, a, a, a range, right? But so our courses focus on those themes and they're community engaged. Right. So many of our courses are taught by faculty who are involved in projects in the community. So students are engaged with community organizations, thinking together about how to address some of the local problems, learning from community members. Um, and as Angel talked about, we have a core curriculum, three courses that all students take when they come in. So they learn cultural competency, a whole course focused on identity, social, you know, kind of thinking about self in society? Who am I? What are the issues that are important to me? What are my experiences and how do I understand others and their experiences so that we can support each other and build together, right? And that I can have a lens that is um, more broad and holistic and understanding issues outside of my own worldview, right? We have courses focused on how to actually make change, grant writing, you know, how to develop a project based on an issue or a need, right? And that is informed by community leaders. Community leaders come in regularly from Newark to talk to our students about the challenges. They're the ones that give critique, right, on the students, mm -hmm. on the project. So we don't have the model of going into a community as experts, we are learning from community. And that's the anchor vision is really a reciprocal vision, right? So they are taking courses together uh, for the first, you know, two years or so. And then, and then they spread their wings, okay? And they go off and they bring these skills and these lenses to their classrooms. Our faculty across the university will tell you, I know when I have HLC scholars, they are active. They are, you know, asking critical questions. They are inspiring the class, right? Um, and so it's powerful and they live together. We have a new building that finally uh, went up in right in downtown Newark um, that is both a class residential space, classroom space, community space. Um, and so that living, that residential experience is also really important. Higher ed feels like it's at an existential crisis. Um, we're hearing lots of conversations about how the tuition model is broken, the application process is biased, diverse students, you know, especially first-generation college students, aren't getting what they need to graduate. So for funders and other people working in the post-secondary space, what are some of the most critical lessons that you would offer up? Um, I would say, number one, I think there's real benefit to cohort models, and we are not the only ones doing this. Whether it's specialized programming based on identity, uh, based on academic interest, but there's something really powerful about in your first year when you come in, being in, even if you can't do a living learning, commuter schools, but this idea of going through a curriculum with a group of people with focused support from faculty, from academic advisors, this kind of high-touch wraparound services is what we call it, right? So let's say Angel or any student comes in and says, you know, I'm struggling in this particular class. We have connections to the learning center, to the tutoring center. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm feeling emotionally overwhelmed. Let's call up the counseling center, right? So part of what happens, we think about why students don't make it. They fall through the cracks. Financial barriers. So clearly, how do we increase financial aid, right, for students so that they can pay for college, but also that they don't have to work so much? A lot of the students who we're with, I mean, part, that's actually a re-education we're, we're doing. We give our students full residential scholarships for the time that they're with us, right? So transfer students, two years, incoming first years, four years. Imagine you don't have to work full time and go to school, right? Because all of that time you're spent working, you're not studying, right? You're not engaged in your classes. That's the benefit of being economically privileged. You don't have to work. And then finally, I, th I think this is really important. Angel mentioned it, but I'm a real fan of um, thinking about culturally responsive pedagogy. In those spaces, what would it be like if all students who were coming in were really able to be in courses where they're connecting deeply with other students, seeing themselves reflected in the curriculum? Um, there's the sense of belonging, especially for students who tend to drop out. There's so much research that that is 
um, a huge factor, right, um, in determining whether a student stays in school. And then the final thing is mentoring. Peer mentoring models are, we have a peer mentoring model, we have a faculty mentoring model, and that is something that universities and schools can develop, right, that is not actually a high cost. It does take um, focused and intentional um, uh, critical reflection, okay, about what you're already doing and shifting. Many spaces are really entrenched in old ways, old modes of operation. Um, it's, I think it's going to take a real paradigm shift. Hmm. So a large frame of this podcast is thinking about how we transform education as a whole. And when we look at high schools that are more human-centered and grounded in a different set of values, I think one of the big concerns people have is students aren't going to be prepared for college if they're not taking tests or they're not taking AP tests. How well prepared did you feel, Angel, to come into a program like this that is obviously rigorous and also forward-looking in terms of what it's what it's defining success and preparation to be? I think that... Big Picture has prepared me while academically still being a part of the school district of Camden um, and still having the same teacher deficits and, and you know absence in different subject areas. The support is what I think. The support, the encouragement, the community. Um, you know, we weren't an actual cohort model, but we were our, each of our grade levels because of how small the school was. My graduating class was only 32 students. So we grew up together, essentially, and we, we, we watched each other through all of our classes. Um, we were all divided up into 9A, 9B, 9C groups, for example, which would resemble cohort groups that you would go through all your classes with. Um, and they were separate from your advisories, right? In the morning, we'd go into our advisory um, where it wasn't just taking attendance and leaving. How's your day going? What What's going on in your life if there's something happening? Um, you know, did you eat? There's teachers asking if you ate. Here's food. We just kind of getting to know each other and preparing us for the day ahead and also kind of ending the day on that same note. Um, so I think academically, I still struggled going into college, but I think the support and the determination that I was shown and kind of nurtured in in high school translated directly in college as, on just a larger scale. And I also didn't feel imposter syndrome. I firmly believe that when you will do better, when you feel like there's people that care about you mm -hmm. when and you care about them, like I want to do good. There's people who are waking up and, and taking time out of their days to really make sure that students are really set and, and, and just preparing themselves for that. On the academic side, you did do kind of real world learning. You did go out and sort of work with organizations. So there's a side of what I'm hearing yes. about the learning experience at the Honors College that you definitely were prepared for yeah. um, in a different way. Does that resonate with you? Yes, certainly, certainly. Our projects and things that we did on a daily basis really worked to strengthen those skills that we were lacking, um, if that makes sense. So for example, mm -hmm. if I'm coming up with a uh, fundraiser for my my high senior class, right? The math I'm learning and how, and actually, you know, in Excel, I'm learning math through that aspect, networking with other people who um, have finance, who have fundraising experiences, right? People who aren't in the schools, getting real world networking experiences, um, drafting letters, emails, things of that sort, getting writing experiences. Um, so while, in high school, it wasn't directly linked to actually sitting in a class and being lectured. We did learn a lot of what we needed to throughout, through like uh, real world experiences. So Marta, when you think about programs like yours, does this feel like an important direction for at least a segment of the higher education landscape? I'm a firm believer in both and, right? We may always have more traditional ways of doing academics, but is it an important direction for higher education to go generally in terms of helping prepare young people for where they're going? Uh, I keep asking the same question in my head, and it's the question that you asked, and it was actually a question that I wanted to ask back to you, which is, what 
are the skills and knowledge that employers are saying, you mentioned students are coming out and they don't, they don't, they're not prepared. And I'm wondering, what, what are those skills? Um, have they articulated what they are? I mean, they are. I think a lot of employers are saying that they want young people who are more self-directed, who are able to kind of live with the ambiguity of not exactly knowing what a project is and how you're going to get there. People need collaboration skills. They need social skills. They need the ability to kind of pivot and tack um, and sort of take on different things. So some people might call those I hate the term, but like non-cognitive or soft skills. But I think some of the reports, um, you know, from the World Bank and McKinsey, just about the future of the world and technology and artificial intelligence is that we need human beings to have deeply human skills, right? Mm. It's less about the analysis and less about the even writing, like artificial intelligence. It's fascinating. A lot of writing and the things that we think of as human capabilities that schools used to do are now going to or soon going to be in the domain of technology and AI. And so it's deeply human skills. It's the ability to navigate complexity, ambiguity. It's ethics, a sense of being able to think through, you know, we can often do things. Should we do things, right? What? Who is it in service of? So it's things like that. Mm-hmm. No, that's really helpful because I think that that helps, helps me to answer your question. You know, I do believe you know, I'm not, um, I believe that, you know, one of the biggest challenge, there are two huge challenges for students graduating from college and particularly the students we've been talking about, right? Um, it, one is financial. Another one is academic skill gaps, right? And, and obviously um, thinking about the environment itself as not being one that's supportive. There are many, many students who are coming that, who are not prepared. Um, but, uh, not just the learning centers and the tutoring centers, but actually at Rutgers University in Newark, um, one of our math professors is really combining, right? So identifying where the skill gap is, because it's not that you need to take a whole remedial English class or a whole remedial, it may be one particular element, right? That needs to be worked on, right? And if that's worked on, you know, everything else kind of falls into place. So thinking a little bit differently about how to deliver those services, but two, he's looking at the internalization, the math stigma. It's not just teaching the skill. It's talking about um, kind of why people believe they're bad at math and how that gets in the way of people being able to move forward. The second thing I would say is in the intergenerational learning communities that we have, we have students who are excellent, right, at writing and math. And Angel will tell you, I mean, in our classes, we do a lot of peer-to-peer um, support. I think that it's much easier to fill a skills gap, right? I had a skills gap when I went to college, a major one. I mean, I, I was like, I can't believe I hadn't really fully read a full book all the way through. Now, I, I mean, I'm pretty accomplished, you know? And so I think that, you know, what it, what it comes down to is being able to have, again, the support and the resiliency. And I think if we can get through the first two years, get the skill support that people need, um, they're going to be fine. Right. So the second piece of what you said was important. That's why I asked, what is missing? I believe that the, what we're teaching our students in the classes, I mean, so much of this is around real world application. So even in terms of cultural competence, how do you, again, navigate multiple people, different needs, team dynamics, group dynamics, be able to talk about different issues, our project-based learning, right? You know, we're working within community organizations. We've got so many internships. I believe that our students graduate feeling prepared to be successful in, in work environments because what you mentioned in terms of what they need, the ability to deal with ambiguity, right? Ethical decision-making, all of those are topics that so i would i would argue that there need to be more of that and i think that people are doing that more and more um, mm -hmm. but it needs to not be seen i think we do still have this challenge of what is cognitive and non cognitive what is viewed as knowledge as valuable knowledge and and i i think that reading and writing and math is very important okay but um many of the folks who founded higher ed um their lives, they were traditionally, you know, white men from upper class environments, right, who could sit around and, and talk about things. I think what people need um, is different now. And I, I believe that our program gives students those skills. 
Well, and I just also want to name, it's not enough to integrate these things in terms of let's do another course on mm-hmm. ethics or ethical decision making. It's actually the difference between thinking about it and doing it because you're working in a nonprofit or on a project where all of a sudden you're grappling with the real world implications. So it's the difference between abstract understanding of something and your embodied lived experience of learning it. Um, and those are kind of two different things. So, you know, a, a lot of our listeners are funders. Um, many of them work inside of K-12. Many of them work inside of higher education and are interested in having an impact, helping practitioners and, and learners like you shift the system to better serve more students. What advice would you offer to fund in terms of their own thinking or the things that they should be learning about if they want to do this in meaningful, sustainable, long-term ways? Yes. Um, I mean, I think I would be thinking really clearly about um, infrastructure kinds of changes. At the end of the day, the reason why we are successful is because we have support from the top. Our chancellor, Um, The institution has dedicated resources uh, for this kind of work, right? Let's look at the best practices, high, you know, uh, wraparound advisement, financial aid, um, uh, you know, cohort models, uh, you know, living learning, peer mentoring. How do we integrate some of those best practices into the larger infrastructure so that all students receive them? all the way through. Angel, I want to ask you the same question. What are the things funders should be thinking about or looking at if they want to make sure that students like you are better served from the start to the completion of this first stage of formal education? I think speaking and, you know, having conversations and seeing what is needed and actually talking to people, um, not kind of looking for a way to give your money, but knowing that you've built a connection that you are going to be able to help sustain and it grow into something, right? Because we know that this is the generation that is going to grow into the next generation. Um, So I think showing the younger generation as they're going through this system and, and, and figuring out how to best support them to be the next thought leaders and tastemakers in their industries, um, showing them that now would make them be able to do the exact same thing from when they have children or when their next generation is coming through. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. So are you encouraging funders to make sure that they're going out and talking with young people directly to understand what they need? Or are you saying invest in programs like what you were describing with Big Picture and your high school experience where you as a young person are given the opportunity to have educators and mentors like your law firm mentor that do that? Or is it both? I just want to make sure folks are walking. You know, okay. I think it's both um, because it, I mean, everything is very, it can be very relative depending on the person, but you, I think genuinely both, um, you know, because it would make it more meaningful on both ends. Also, it wouldn't feel like it's a transactional thing happening. It wouldn't feel like someone is just doing something to say they've done it or it wouldn't feel, yeah, it like, it wouldn't just feel like a transaction. It would genuinely Mm -hmm. feel like, you know, there's a connection being made and that there's support being poured into someone or a group of individuals, a school, a program, a university, et cetera. And if I were to pull from a couple of other things I've, I've heard you say, also thinking about how do we value the different skills that students kind of come in? How do we allow them to, to access an education that gives them different ways to, um, to sort of access and show what they know and who they are? Um, so yeah, thank you. Now, Marta, I want to go back to this idea of infrastructure investments. So there's a type of funding that's short-term, very programmatically focused, and that feels like the vast majority of funding that is out there. But if we think about infrastructure investment, it's like roads and bridges, right? Once you build them, you have to maintain them, but the structures exist. I'm curious, what kinds of infrastructure investments would enable more programs like the Honors Living Learning Community to be launched? And then, yes, there would be sustaining dollars needed, but it might be interesting for funders to get clearer on where they could invest in infrastructure 
um, that would enable programs like yours to kind of pop up in different communities in a way that would fundamentally change the landscape of higher education. I was thinking about one of our prior guests who talked about villages. And, you know, when we talk about these things and think about these things in the abstract, they can feel really overwhelming. But like you're working in Newark. This is your community. It's your village. And the question became, how do we in this, in our village, in our community, create a program that gives access for? And, you know, what would it look like if you could make sure that within every state, at least, there was access to a program like yours. Like that would be Mm -hmm. an incredible sort of step. And so maybe thinking about it from that perspective as a funder or a community leader, what could you do in your sphere of influence, right? The place where you are to make something like this real. And that might look really different um, in different places. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Anything we didn't cover today that um, that you want to make sure we touch on? It's more of a closing thought, right? When we first started the program, there was doubt, okay, from lots of people in the community. Are you going to be able to find this many, right, uh, 50 scholars from Newark? Mm -hmm. And by well-meaning people, because I'm really interested in kind of the internalization of those ideas. And it was overwhelming. I just want to tell you, in our admissions process, I mean, we don't just have Newark residents, clearly angels from Camden, but a similar kind of city. Our, these students perform very well. They were at the top. We always have to turn many students away, right? So it's this interesting piece around like when you shift what you understand as um, the kinds of knowledge and skills that students need to be who we need in the world right? When you shift what you value just slightly, right? We have no problem getting those students. And then the second piece is, well, they're not going to perform as well, right? Somehow we've got the traditional honors college, that's the smart honors college. And then you've got the HLC for kids who, you know, wouldn't have gotten other places. And sometimes our students even internalize that. But guess what? That is not panning out in the GPAs, right? Our average, so our incoming average GPA, again, we didn't look at that first, but this year is a 3.7. So, I mean, it just, it's, it, it just focuses again on like, if you create the supports and the environment that are right, students can be successful. Amen. Any closing thoughts, Angel? You know, I would never stop ever thinking about ways in which the system, the education system has failed Many students and in times where I thought I wasn't even going to progress past high school and my thoughts of wanting to drop out, I think there's hope above all. And I think that with everyone involved and knowing that it takes a village to raise a child, right? And that in all of these communities, no matter what they may be told, they're absolutely worth every investment possible in wanting to be successful and knowing that they are going to be the next thought leaders and tastemakers, as I said, in their industries and the next lawyers, the next people fighting for social justice rights and people who are just good human beings, people who have humility, people who are very nice. Like that's really to sum that up. Mm. Well, that is a wonderful place to end, and I am glad that you are going to be taking up the mantle. Um, Thank you both so much for your time. Really appreciated today's conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. The Future of Smart podcast is a project of Grantmakers for Education and is made possible through the support of our generous member sponsors. If you like the podcast, please follow or subscribe and follow us on social media. You can find links to resources related to today's episode in the show notes. More episodes and events can be found at edfunders.org. To learn more about the future of smart, visit ulca.com, U-L-C-C-A.com. U-L-C-C-A.com.